Ja, danke für die netten Worte der Einführung. Ich müsste jetzt hier glauben. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Perhaps a few words about the title, uh, Future Studies and Ideation. Future studies tend to be rather boring because they normally end up with reports. People draw up scenarios, write reports, uh, give the reports to the government and expect the government to do something, and then they write a new report. I find that rather boring, and we at Daimler wanted to to do something different, and this is why we use the term ideation. If anybody can come up with a better term, uh, you're welcome. So uh, we take things Seriously, I'm afraid you can't see what I am just referring to. Yes, anyone who focuses solely on the technology has not yet grasped how autonomous driving will change our society. That is an essential finding. We, as an automotive company, are not just building cars. We want to enter into a dialogue with the outside world. We want to reach out to the world and engage in a discussion about how to do things and what to do. The car, over the past 100 years, has changed society as a whole. The car has been a change agent like nothing else. Now the car itself is going to be changed. And everything that has changed because of the car will change with the car. And that means that society as a whole, that's a huge task coming up. Now, um, talking about future studies, uh, first, we need to learn. We look back to the past. We look at the driving forces. You have to develop a feeling of time. You can't uh, engage in future studies without having a feeling of time. And we're not good at that. Ten years is endless for us. A cup of coffee is OK, but 20 years is inconceivable. So you've, this is the first step. Then you look around in the world, and then you do something. That's the third step. Now, I'll show you an excerpt from a film made in 1939. This is the blueprint of our world, as seen in 1939, quite a long time ago. Rich in sunshine is the city of 1960. Fresh air, fine green parkways, recreational and civic centers. Modern and efficient city planning, breathtaking architecture, each city block a complete unit in itself. Here is an important intersection in the great metropolis of 1960. Elevated sidewalks give a new measure of safety and convenience to pedestrians. They actually double the available width for traffic in the street. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Well, as you've seen, that was the future. Uh, seen from the 1939 perspective. And we once had an urban planner in Shanghai, and we asked him what has changed. And he said, now, it's still exactly the same, but they have high-speed trains on top of that. So it's still the blueprint. When you walk through Linz, you will see 
a broad street. If you want to cross that street, uh, you have to take a detour. And if you want to take a bend as a driver, it's also very frustrating. You need a lot of space for traffic. Uh, cars are separate, pedestrians are separate, cyclists are separate. So a lot of space is used up. And that's not possible anymore in the future. But that has been the driving force th since 1939. And this is what we are confronted with today. A second driving force is cybernetics. Everything from Google to Amazon to cell phones, uh, the basic ideas first came up around 1940. Norbert Wiener, who came up with the term cybernetics, he was the first one to use it. We know what's going on with artificial intelligence, machine intelligence. Read up on Norbert Wiener and you will understand everything. One of the great future problems which we must face is the relation between man and the machine. At that time, it was a purely theoretical problem. Today, we have it as a real problem. We have robotics, we have autonomous uh, cars. So the relationship between man and machine has to be redefined. And then he said, render on to man the things which are man's and onto the computer the things which are the computer's. It sounds easy, but it raises the question of the image of man. We have to ask ourselves, what is human? How do we project the human image into the future? What do we want there? What should the machine be able to do? What are the talents of human beings, social uh, feelings, perception, empathy? This is not something we want to automate. Uh, an automatic reception desk in a hotel is a terrible idea because uh, you may be desperate and completely stressed. The robot at the reception desk will never understand that, not even notice that. So um, each and every one of us can ask themselves, what are my talents as a human being and what do I cede to the machine? Of course, those were different times. Uh, Many things were better, freer. You could smoke whenever and wherever you liked. Those were the driving forces. Now, when we take a look around, uh, cybernetics, artificial intelligence, in 1950, it all began. Um, urban development, uh, 1939, that's all very old. It has a long history and deep roots. Now, what are people doing today, artists, for example? This is the happiness machine uh, by uh, Mark Thornton uh, from the, uh, the United States. Uh, people all look similar. The financial world at the top, the consumers at the bottom, and in the middle, at the center, the baby, a fetus, helpless fetus on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's the future. The only um, thing that can move um, that has space to move is the baby. So we are discussing this with executives, and we ask them, do you want a world like this? And they all say, no, we don't want it. So we say, let's do it differently. You have to show images like this one, artists' views in order to show what you don't want. This is another uh, picture um, from an architect in London, Edwards. Um, well, London is not like that yet, but uh, this is uh, what uh, the plans are. Uh, High-rise buildings, uh, and it won't be possible. Uh, there will be a competition for space, so you can't keep things apart anymore, pedestrians, cars, etc. Mobility takes place in public space, and public, there is going to be a great shortage of public space. And what are we going to do? When we look at this small green bridge across the Thames, um, this is not fantasy anymore. It's a proposal for London. 
a pedestrian bridge with an island across the River Thames. And here you can see the change of paradigm since 13, uh, sorry, 1939. That was an efficient urban machine then. And this is what people need now. They all need recreation. Um, Whenever you ask people, they say, yes, I want to be there on this bridge because it's beautiful, it's great. Of course, some say they don't want to build such a build because it's uh, uh, superfluous, they think. There are still people who have survived from the 1939 world. Now, what is this? This is an image from a f from the festival, the Ars Electronica Festival in Litz. People sitting on artificial turf. What are they doing there? Picnicking and uh, we asked ourselves in our own research in uh, on the car 2015, what do people want? They want to talk to each other. They want to have social contacts. They don't have their tablets or smartphones at hand. Uh, they were picnicking or playing cards. I tried it out in at the at Almeida. We heard. We had 60 lectures, and uh, uh, I asked people, and I heard that I, I, said, I proposed digital has lost its cool, and 80% of the people agreed. Like electricity or running water, you have it, but it's not cool anymore. Your smartphone is not cool anymore because everybody has got it. Everybody has it. But this is what's cool. That's an important point for the F015. What are the collective needs? You don't want this. Of course, you can walk past efficiently. This is what you want when you offer something like this, public furniture like this. People are going to use it. It's uh, from a museum in San Francisco. San Francisco. And it's a task for engineers to look at. Look how good people feel. Turn this into car, into a car. Make it move. Make it mobile. And then you've got the um, F015. We did a number of variants of the F015, including a. Uh, lawn to lie down on, which uh, you can have, uh, which you can spread out in your car. But uh, if uh, um, the car has to do an emergency, if an emergency break, if emergency braking is required, um, the people lying on the lawn would get hurt. So we uh, had to make some changes. This is one of the public parklets in San Francisco. This is what people want. They want to redesign public space. They built a kind of boat. This is what it looks like from the inside. So public space is being converted already from a traffic space, a mobility space, into a human habitat, into a multifunctional space. Just pay attention to that. Uh, what's interesting also is the cafe in the background. They had no Wi-Fi. I went in. Um, I got talking with people and I found a note there saying that we remodeled the cafe. We switched off the Wi-Fi and uh, um, the reaction was so positive from uh, people that they gave up Wi-Fi altogether. It's not Starbucks, by the way. Starbucks is mainstream. This is a different world. I liked it very much. So what can you make of it? I said that writing reports and drawing up scenarios is boring. So we asked ourselves, with all our creative people, what's going to be the city of the future? What will be mobile? The, the infrastructure could be mobile, a garden that comes to you, a moving garden. The vehicles that drive automatically ask people, do you want some greenery around? You don't need to build a park. You can take the vehicle, the garden vehicle there, and then a machine um, selling drinks, a drink vending machine. 
mobility is no longer driving from A to B, but staying wherever one is, and technology comes to you. How can you convert a city that exists already? This is from Milan. Currently, it's a hostile place, but it could be converted. The little vehicles, uh, well, if you want some privacy in the city where everything is crowded, you can sit in one of those vehicles and move around. Well, we asked the artists, why no bicycles? And he said, no, I don't like bicycles. But it's rather well done. It's not completely futuristic. That was the mandate. Most of the buildings have to remain the way they are. We don't want to spend billions on converting them. Well, as regards the car, uh, the idea also for the F015 was if you have to feel at ease. the interior matters, maximum comfort and convenience. Now, people are sitting there having a glass of champagne, perhaps not possible in reality, but it's meant to convey the moods, uh, the atmosphere in the car. This is um, Sylvain's design, uh, which was converted into a real car. And here is the real car. When you look at the car and when you can see it drive around. It looks as if it were made in Photoshop. That it, when I first saw it, I thought, now the future has started because the thing really moves and it, the effect it generates is extreme. And I wonder where this extreme uh, impression comes from. We showed the model to many people, and this uh, picture, this photo was shown at Consumer Electronics, and for most of the people, uh, uh, this is what they want of mobility, relaxation. Most people move around a great deal, like all of you, I suppose, and what you want is a situation like this. You're mobile. You're on the way and relaxing nevertheless, having a cup of coffee, a latte, if you like, because it's so fashionable. It has nothing to do with driving a car in the conventional uh, sense of the term. It's a place that moves. It's luxury <coughs> in motion. So let me move on to a different topic. I spoke about communication. Now, what's human and what is robotic? This is human mobility, human interaction. They're all uh, ice skating in New York. And when you look at that picture, you will know immediately, you can see the couple with the child in the middle. They are paying attention to the child and uh, they are not paying attention to other skaters. And uh, when we see them, we will, of course, uh, pass them by because we don't expect them to pay attention to us. And then there is a woman who looks quite a bit distracted, so we are not going to approach her directly because she's not paying attention or in the middle. Two girls quite relaxed. Now. We would think that they react to us because we are not as good uh, in, at skating as they are. The robot would not indicate where it's going. It might be perfect, but we don't know anything about the robot. And that would be extremely dangerous because everything that we can perceive at a glance, where can we go? Where is it safe? Where is it unsafe? That would disappear. Our ability as humans to assess a situation would disappear. That would be very dangerous. And that's an essential idea. And with the F-015, we said that the mobile robots have to communicate their intentions, their abilities, their uh, what they want to do, because otherwise it's dangerous. Now, we can easily cope with a situation like this, but not the robot. 
And that leads us on to the question of what should not be automated and what is to be automated. We don't want to automate social perceptiveness. Well, willful action. We as humans come up with rather strange ideas that cannot be pre-programmed, so we have to remain flexible. On the other hand, what can we automate? Part of the infrastructure, uh, a mobile robot uh, can stay awake and uh, take a 360 degree all around view. We can't do that. We can't stay awake for 24 hours. We have no eyes at the back of our heads. Uh, so on the left is in blue is what the machine can done. On the right in yellow, what we as human beings can done. Uh, Martina is going to tell you more about that. We don't want to automate the things in yellow. So whenever you have to uh, talk to robot people, ask them first what they do not want to automate. Uh, they want to, most of them want to automate everything, and they expect us to behave accordingly. But that's not okay. Always ask them what do they not want to automate. Now, we had a future talk on robot interaction. Martina is going to show you more about that. I'll give you a quick impression. I think that's the picture I like best. So we're going to see more about that later, and Martina is going to explain all about it. But with a vehicle, we only have light signals for the time being. We don't have sound signals, so through a light a signal, the car indicates that it wants to turn left. So light signals are used to communicate what the car is doing or what it intends to do. Here, the car communicates that it's stopping because someone is crossing the road. So an automatic vehicle can do that because it recognizes and understands its environment. Now, we were talking about willful action earlier. In 15 or 20 years, people may organize a picnic day, picnic in the street. Uh, that's the coolest thing to do. Nobody has pre-programmed that in the car, so we have to make sure. And we did so by means of the signposts. So these are cheap signposts which you place around the picnic space, and all the robots will know I'm not allowed to go there. And you can tell children not behind that fence. Don't go behind that fence. It's easy and flexible. Uh, we don't need to predict if people will ever organize a picnic in the street today. All we need is these signposts and fences because we want a flexible public space that is flexible and safe and a lot of fun. This is another picture I'd like to show you. Not necessarily only cars. You don't only automate cars. In the future, we will have more of a sharing or collaborative economy. Uh, market stands. People pick up uh, the produce, and they take the produce to where 
people are. So the infrastructure goes to people, and then the vehicle comes back having sold all the produce. This is important for sustainable cities because we don't have to need to have a fixed infrastructure. We can have mobile infrastructure. We shouldn't just think about cars. Once the interaction is safe, you can do something like this, moving market stands, but all sorts of other things. Uh, the park bench can come to you. You don't need to go to the park to sit on a bench. You look tired, the park bench comes to you. So one last picture I wanted to show you. This is Rafael Capuro, a couple of his ideas. He says that the image of the car driver of the 20th century has become a thing of the past, a sentimental memory. Um, the great freedom driving like Thelma and Louise uh, with a bottle of whiskey in your hand, driving through Death Valley at night without safety belts, no GPS, no smartphone, you can't be detected. You're really free. That is a thing of the past. That is a sentimental memory. And what he says is that the image of the 20th century is purely sentimental and a thing of the past. But the image of the 21st century has not yet been invent invented. We don't really know yet what the car driver of uh, the 21st century will be like. And he also says that the Western image of the autonomous individual will have to give way to the hetero heteronymous human being. What does that mean? I decide everything. I no longer decide everything for myself. Uh, we have got our smartphone. We've got a map there. And the map is uh, uh, taking you by your nose and thinking for you. And I am uh, determined by others. My actions are determined by others. And this is what he means by the heteronymous individual. And here the question of cybernetics comes in, robotics. What can robotics do? And with this, I hand over to Martina, who is going to explain everything to us. But first, I need to show you the F-015 movie. This is the vehicle in motion. It's a kind of clean and empty world because it would be very expensive to have people and trees there. We're not Hollywood. Uh, there is hardly anybody there. Das hier, hier parkt das Fahrzeug. Vehicle is parked here. So the vehicle can park. You can have your parking space wherever you want. The vehicle can park by itself. They don't need to park at the roadside. So that's the passenger. You can control the vehicle from whatever position you like. You have a command module which you can swipe. And you can sit. The, the passenger can sit wherever he or she wants. And you can tell the vehicle heading north, I want to go here or there. You don't know, you don't need to enter your destination. It gives you more autonomy and uh, it takes away the anxiety. Yesterday, we spoke about the um, flying carpet image. You tell it to go north, and it goes north as far as it can. You can see the blue light. It has been communicating with people who don't want to cross the road. Here is the car is indicating that it wants to park. Here it's being recharged, a couple of clouds. So you can change the seat position. Uh, people can communicate uh, sitting face to face. Well, of course, there are not enough people around. Well, that was it. <coughs> so freedom of 
choosing your direction. You don't just go from A to B. You have a certain amount of freedom in the car. There may be the parents sitting in the front and uh, the daughter sitting uh, in the back row and the um, daughter tells the car to go to the nearest ice cream parlor. And with this, I hand over to Martina.